Well, again, uh, good morning, everyone. To those of you watching online, welcome. That was, uh, that was exciting. We have a part of what is going on there, right? Through uh, finances, in prayer, to come alongside and partner with people who are serving on that campus. Uh, that's joy for us. And to hear stories about uh, this young woman who engages in a spiritual conversation who prays to receive Christ. Uh, that's exciting. And it was uh, particularly exciting. I know uh, Dave and Audrey know Dave and Sue well from their years at Bethel in Marquette. Anne and I were serving in Marquette when Dave and Sue moved to Marquette 33 years ago. We were serving there, and we became friends. They participated in the church that Ann and I were serving there, uh, Bethel in Marquette. And uh, Dave became one of the elders. Dave, you and I worked on that organizational restructure at, at Bethel that God has blessed and used for a number of years. It's just so good to have you with us. Well, before Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection, Jesus said to a band of followers on the Mount of Olives, you will be my witnesses. And in the days following, those believers would bear witness to what they had seen and heard and experienced through their own personal encounter with Jesus. It would be their privilege, their calling, to make Christ known to others. Now this morning, what we want to do here is we want to affirm that the charge Jesus gave to his followers in the first century is still in force. Jesus is still saving people, and he's still reorienting lives the crucified and risen Lord Jesus is alive and reigning, and we're told in God's word that he has chosen to introduce himself to others primarily through the honest, first-hand testimony of those whose lives have been changed and are being changed by him. We are to make him known. We're in a teaching series at Grace where we're spending 10 weeks this fall thinking together about our core values as a church. And we've said at different points in this series that our core values flow out of our vision statement and our core values really steer us in the direction of that vision statement, which is to know Christ and to make Christ known. We envision increasingly in the days ahead a fellowship where people relationally know Jesus personally better and better and where we're mobilizing people here to make Christ known to others in the world. And this morning in our time together, we come to this critically important core value that's vitally connected to our vision. And here it is on, uh, on the screen. We believe in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with all people beginning in our own community and then throughout the world. This particular value focuses very much on that portion of our vision that says we want to make Christ known. We begin in our community and we aim to reach throughout the world. We've got partners in Marquette at Northern Michigan University. We've got partners in other parts of the United States and around the world who uh, go in Jesus name in part sent by us as we partner with them to share Jesus in different places. In other words, in other words, we want to engage in this mission of making Christ known in contexts that are local, regional, 
cross-cultural and global. It was in Acts 1.8, prior to ascending into heaven, that Jesus said, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Locally, Jerusalem. Regionally, in all Judea. Cross-culturally, in all Samaria. And globally, to the ends of the earth. We want at Grace Church to be part of a movement. We want to be part of a movement raised up by Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, that is functioning in all of these contexts where more and more people are introduced to Jesus and to a life-changing relationship with him. Listen to Jesus. Listen to what he said in Matthew 9, verses 37 and 38. This is going to be on the, the screen. But Jesus is speaking here. Listen to him. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And again, here's that vital core value that we're considering this morning at Grace Church. We believe in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with all people, beginning in our own community and then throughout the world. May the Holy Spirit help us and open our eyes this morning. For my part in teaching, I want to direct our attention to 1 Corinthians 9. If you have a Bible, you could turn there right now. We'll be looking primarily at verses 19 to 23 with a real focus on verse 22 this morning. In a moment, we're going to pray and we're going to honestly ask God to help us to translate this core value that we're considering together this morning, that we would translate it into action for the glory of Jesus and for the salvation of many, many people. Father in heaven, we do come to you right now. Help us. Open our eyes. Open our hearts. Speak in your own unique way to us by your spirit, through your word. God, we pray that Jesus would be exalted, that as a result of today, more and more people will at least have a chance to hear good news. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. On 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23, this is what we read. Apostle Paul writing to the church in Corinth, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win, it's a key word, that I might win more of them. To the Jews, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not, my, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I may share with them in its blessings. I need to say right at the outset of trying to very briefly this morning unpack this passage. I've been influenced in my thinking about this passage by a, a mentor that the Lord brought into my life, the late Dr. Haddon Robinson. His handling of this passage that we're looking at today has challenged me and left a mark on me. It was the Holy Spirit who directed the Apostle Paul to write the words that we just read 
in verses 19 to 23. It was a part of a letter that he wrote to a church in Corinth. It was a coastal city in what is now Greece. Very cosmopolitan city. And after the risen Lord Jesus radically confronted and transformed the apostle Paul, Paul lived with a passion for winning. Interestingly, Paul's passion for winning was characterized, now watch this, because this is important. His passion for winning was characterized not with power, but with weakness. And not with pride, but with humility. And frankly, those are not qualities that we usually associate with winning. But then Paul was not after a temporary prize or a seasonal championship or a seasonal victory. The winning he pursued had transformational, lasting impact on people. Paul was focused on winning people to Jesus. He was a winner. Empowered by the Holy Spirit to engage in the most meaningful and transformational enterprise in all of history. Most of us are aware that a commitment to winning in any enterprise usually calls for focus and even sacrifice. On the screen, there is a picture of Van Cliburn, an outstanding piano player. At the age of 23 in 1958, he went to Russia to, to participate in a first international Tchaikovsky competition on the piano. And at the age of 23, he won that international competition. In the years that followed, he played for every U.S. president, right up to President Obama. Van Cliburn died in 2013. He was a masterful piano player. On one occasion, after a concert, he was approached by an admiring fan who said, she said to him, I would give everything to be able to play the piano the way you did. And Van Cliburn responded to her and said, ma'am, that's exactly what it took. And so it was for Paul. And so it was for Paul. Paul poured everything he could into this compelling mission of winning people to Jesus Christ. He gave everything. In fact, uh, toward the end of his life, during the reign of a rather despotic Emperor Nero in Rome, Paul was executed during the reign of Nero. In the outworking of Paul's passion to win people to Jesus, he paid a price. Yet somehow, through all of the adversity, this man of diminutive physical stature was powerfully used by God to change the history of the world. He won lasting victories. Not with the sword or with physical power, but in weakness and humility and the power of the Holy Spirit. Interestingly, in our day, we name our dogs after Nero. We name our sons after Paul. So it seems worthwhile to at least ask the question, what was it that kept Paul so focused on mission as he followed Jesus? Certainly, Paul was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And friends, isn't this good news? That same Holy Spirit that empowered Paul is with us today. He's in us. We have all of him that there is to have. The question is, does he have all of us? Are we surrendered to him? Unapologetically, Paul wanted men and women to know and trust Jesus. Why? 
Jesus had transformed Paul's life. He'd entirely changed him. And Paul knew that the gospel was the power of God for the salvation of people all around him in the Mediterranean world. Paul had something like an athletic champion's perspective about following Jesus and living out the gospel. Look at what he says in the, the next two verses, in verses 24 and 25 of 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? And I just need to pause here parenthetically. Right now, at this time, one of my sons-in-law who's been training for many, many months just took off with a wave of runners in the New York City Marathon today. Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. The image that Paul utilized in these verses related to the Greek games, which the people in Corinth were intimately familiar with. We live in a sports-obsessed society, but it was not like it was in Greece. The Greeks did even more. The Greeks measured time. Watch this. They measured time from the beginning of the Olympic Games. So to them, time was B-O-G or A-O-G. Before the Olympic Games, after the Olympic Games. Those games were played every four years in Olympus, in ancient Greece. And every three years, there were the Isthmian Games at Corinth. The citizens of Greece were crazed about these games. All over Greece, athletes devoted their time and attention to working out for nine months at least to be able to compete in the games. And the Apostle Paul evidently admired these athletes. They gave up everything in order to compete. They gave up everything. And it's as though Paul is saying in this passage, that's the kind of passion that I want to bring to my calling. That's the kind of passion I bring to my calling to win people. So Paul was, able, was willing to give up any right that he had in order to make Jesus Christ known. And what kind of rights did he give up? Early in 1 Corinthians 9, beginning of the chapter, we learn that Paul gave up his right to expect to draw income from his service to the churches. Interestingly, the Lord, it was the Lord who had commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. Yet Paul relinquished this right. You see, when Paul came to Corinth, he wasn't after Corinthian gold. He was after Corinthians. He wanted to win Corinthians. Secondly, in sharing with these diverse audiences that were there, Paul had to build different types of bridges so that he could relate to different respective audience. Paul didn't change the message. He never changed the central message whether he was in Jerusalem or Antioch or Ephesus or Corinth or Philippi, his message always focused on Jesus Christ and him crucified. He never compromised the gospel. Yet in reaching people, in building relational bridges to people, Paul would adapt the presentation of the gospel in order to contextualize the message to present unchanging truth 
to people living in a changing world with a variety of cultural contexts. When I read these verses in 1 Corinthians 9, I find myself wondering what could happen in Delta County? What could happen in Delta County if a movement of Christ followers in Delta County lived with this kind of passion to win others to Jesus Christ? I just wonder what could happen. Because here's what strikes me. It's as though Paul is saying, I will do anything short of sinning to win men and women to Jesus Christ. If you hear anything this morning, I pray that this passion that pulsed in Paul will somehow rattle around in your thinking and in your affections. And would you pray that it does in mine as well? Paul was saying, I will do anything short of sinning to win men and women to Jesus Christ. There's a brother in this church who, as much as anybody I know, is gripped with this passion. His name's Noel Segan. Noel, where are you right now? There he is right over here. Noel, would you come to the platform right now? Noel's going to just share a little bit from his own heart about this passion. Would you help me to welcome our friend and brother, Noel Segan? Thank you. Good morning. So I, too, am going to talk about uh, the second half of our mission statement, uh, to make Christ known. And uh, to begin with, uh, it seems like a simple statement, uh, simple enough at first glance, but what does it really mean? Uh, you would think that everyone knows Jesus, right? Uh, it's, it's, but it's one thing to know Jesus and it's something else to be a fully devoted follower and to know what Jesus' life, the, the implications are on our own life. I was a late comer to becoming a believer. I once heard a statistic that said that if you haven't become a Christ follower by the time you're 18 years old, that you probably aren't going to. Um, but with the uh, help of my wife, and even my children, uh, I've come to have a relationship with God uh, that gave me the answers to life uh, when I had no meaningful answers or solutions. After coming to Grace Church, I received an invitation uh, from the lead pastor to join a mentoring group. And in this mentoring group, uh, it lasted two years. He gave me the... Um, uh, he gave me the idea that I needed to share my passion for God, my passion for Christ, uh, with the people around me. He impressed on me that uh, my testimony and my faith were something that were not of my own, uh, that I needed to give them away. And uh, when he did that, he also let me know that here in the UP that many are unchurched. He gave me a figure of 85%, and I think last week Pastor uh, Tim uh, mentioned something similar that 82%, I think it was, uh, are still unchurched, and, and that really bothered me um, because the implications of that are that many of the unchurched are also unsaved. So I was actually shocked by this at the time, and I had no idea uh, that this was so and thought that maybe the figures were inaccurate. But I've come to know that uh, it was no mistake, and it still isn't today. And after being shocked, I was grieved. The Holy Spirit worked in me and, and caused me to grieve that many unsaved souls 
uh, I must walk by every day. And then after I was grieved, I was ashamed. I was ashamed that I didn't do anything. So I made it a point to start a cycle of prayer in my life uh, to ask God to give me the courage to speak on his behalf to people. And it was hard. You can tell I'm not a great eloquent speaker. Um, and that he would bring the lost before me. And what do you think happened? He did. He did in a big way. And no, I'm not an eloquent speaker, and, and I'm not a fancy wordsmith, and many people know their Bible better than I. I had many fears. I had fears that uh, people would reject me, that they would laugh at me, um, or that I wouldn't have enough Bible knowledge to answer the questions that they might have for me. But I can truly say that the old axiom is true that God doesn't necessarily call the most equipped, but he equips those he calls. And he did that with me. One day, just uh, to tell you a few of my experiences, one day at our favorite uh, building box store, I think we all know here in Escanaba, I was looking at fittings, plumbing fittings, uh, because I had a project to do, and I had a a man approached me, and this man was visually shaken. He was uh, profusely sweating, and he walks up to me, and he says, Do you know Christ? Do you have Christ in your life? And I smiled, and I said to him, uh, Yes, I assured him I did have Christ in my life. And that impressed me so much that this man with what looked to be a mountain of obstacles would share Jesus with me. So from then on, uh, I, I told myself I need to earnestly pray for what I now call my divine appointments. Uh, and God has amazingly uh, obliged me. Never in my wildest imaginations did I ever think that that uh, one day I would share the gospel with family members, my brothers, with my in-laws, or a homeless man pushing a cart on one leg down a street in the middle of winter, or a man unknown to me out of the blue who approached me and asked me if I had answers for his troubled life. I did. Or the man I shared Jesus with as he pumped out our sewer. It was the end of the day, and he was tired, and I'll say stained with his day's work. Yet he patiently listened to me as I shared Jesus. And later, we prayed together as we stood over our 1,250-gallon septic tank. So I'm here just to say to you that you can do this too. By all accounts, uh, we're closer than ever to Jesus' return, and so that makes a great urgency to this ministry. I've come to learn many techniques to share, uh, to share the gospel of Christ, and next week at this time we'll speak again, and Pastor Dave will talk about uh, being a fully devoted follower. Several weeks ago, Pastor John threw down a huge challenge to us. He, he, he gave us a challenge to work together as a church and to grow together. And this is a great opportunity uh, to plug in here at Grace, and an even better opportunity for your personal spiritual growth. So please start with prayer and ask how you might serve in God's great commission to share your faith. And as always, all we do is for his glory. Thank you. Thanks, Noel. I mean, I, uh, I wanted him to share because uh, 
I know he's active in sharing his faith multiple times a week. Praying that God will open doors to spiritual conversations. And he shares his faith. Next Sunday evening in the youth room at 6.30 p.m., Noel is going to facilitate a faith-sharing workshop, which will be the first of a series of workshops like that that Noel is going to lead. So at Grace Church, again, here's that core value. We believe in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ with all people, beginning in our community and then throughout the world. Paul said, I've become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. And you can almost hear some well-intentioned Christian say to Paul, Hey, Paul, <laughs> you don't win them. The Spirit of God wins them. And Paul would say, Yes, that's, that's true. And, and I am resolved to do my part to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in winning them. Oh, but Paul, you don't save them. The Spirit of God saves them. And I imagine Paul would have responded, yes, yet I am not free to ignore the responsibility and calling that God has assigned to me to care about the desperate need of people all around me and people all around the world who need Jesus. And while there was hardship and suffering in Paul's desire to win people, there was also the very real thrill of victory. There is indeed thrilling joy in knowing Jesus and making him known. There just is. And some of you have had this experience. And I just pray it will multiply more and more here. When you have opportunity to be in the room when a man or woman crosses that line of faith and decisively trusts Jesus for the first time, they surrender to him. Oh, there's nothing like it. There's really nothing like it. It's unspeakable joy. It's hard to put into words. Figuratively, in keeping with the Olympic imagery in this passage, we might say that one day, one day, Jesus Christ himself will preside over the awarding of medals. He will be the master of ceremonies at the medals presentation. Jesus graciously giving to Christians, to followers, of Christ, the crown that will last forever. And I just want to say this to you, Grace Church, as a pastor and as a friend. I want for you one day, I want so much for you one day, to hear the Savior Jesus say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. I want that so much for my wife, Anne. I want, it for, I want it for all of you. I want you one day before him to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servants. Until then, there is cost in this passion to win people to Jesus. Bob Richards, the Olympic pole vault champion, said he would ask Olympic athletes, how did you handle the pain? He said he never had anyone say to him, what pain? No one ever said that. They all knew that pain would be a part of securing victory, of winning. Pain accompanies an honest passion to win. Let's not be put off by the challenge, but compelled by the prospect of reaching more people for Jesus, one life at a time, one heart at a time, in the power of the Holy Spirit, to the end that more and more people will be saved from the prospect of hell and more and more people saved to the promise of heaven for all of eternity. 
that kind of passion to percolate in us as a church family. I pray for my own heart and for the hearts of multiple people under the hearing of my voice this morning, both in the room and online. By God's grace, may we embrace this posture of Paul that we see in 1 Corinthians 9.22 where he makes it real clear. I will do anything short of sinning to win men and women to Jesus Christ. Father in heaven, Lord, do what only you can do. God, do it more deeply in my own heart. Do it in the hearts of those who are here this morning who know you personally already through faith in Jesus. God, I also pray you'd be speaking right now to those under the hearing of my voice who've never decisively said yes to Jesus. Father, open their eyes, open their hearts, and Lord, we do pray that your spirit would irresistibly draw them. In Jesus' name, amen.